Thanks so much. Good morning. My name is Carlos de la Torre, and I am the current director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida. Today, it's a very special day, and I want to thank all of you for attending. Our center, the oldest in the nation, and one of the top academic institutions in the world and at the University of Florida is turning 90, a very respectable age indeed. I want to thank Provost Glover for his continuous support to the center and to our former directors, Terry McCoy, Carmen Diana Deer, and Phil Williams for their persistent engagement and dedication to our institution. I also want to acknowledge our faculty, librarians, staff, students, and alumni for making the center a convivial and caring space for rigorous research and international learning. When I was an undergraduate student at the University of Florida in the early 80s, the center was my academic home. I had the luxury of taking courses with incredible faculty like Terry McCoy, Helen Safa, Marianne Schmink, Hernan Vera, Glaucio Suarez, David Bushnell, Andres Avellaneda, among others. My academic interest in populism, democratization, protest, and social justice were first developed taking classes at the center. After teaching at different institutions in the United States and in Ecuador, I had the privilege of returning here after 26 years to direct a very and unique program of Latin American studies. Our center is unique because faculty from the humanities, the natural sciences and the social sciences work jointly together on critical topics related to the environment, development, racism in the Americas and movements for social justice. COVID-19 hit after eight months that I started my tenure here at the University of Florida. This horrible epidemic showed me the resilience of our students who, were, who reinvented their projects and are finishing their master's programs on time. Despite the fact that they were not able to do research in situ, they were able to finish successfully and they are finishing successfully their, their master's degree. I also was also very impressed by the commitment of the faculty, librarians, and the staff to our students. Today, Provost Glover is going to tell us the importance of the center to the university. Professor Carmen Diana Deer, the director of the center between 2004 and 2009, and is an economist and an expert on women and development, will talk about the early history of the center from the 1930s to the 60s. Professor Terry McCoy, who directed the center between 1985 and 1996, and is a political scientist, and whose research focuses on inter-American relations and business and investing in Latin America, will talk about the center from the 1960s to the 90s. And Dean Phil Williams, who's also a political science, and was the director of our center from 2009 to 2019, and whose work focuses on religion and politics, democratization and transnational migration, will talk about the challenges for Latin American studies in the 21st century. After the presentation, our panelists will interact with each other. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to a second panel celebrating the center on this Friday at 1 p.m. And the panel is going to be on critical perspectives on development. Provost Glover, thanks so much. The floor is yours and we we'll start the celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, it is, <clears throat> Carlos was thanking me just a couple of minutes ago for supporting the, uh, the center for all these many years. Uh, but in fact, it, it's very easy to support the center. Uh, the center has been remarkably successful and plays a remarkable role in the evolution of the University of Florida over the history of the university, as I think you'll hear about uh, during the course of these few speeches today. Uh, but I just, I just want to emphasize a few points about, about the center, which I think are worth recalling and, and which get, get driven home to me whenever somebody from outside the university talks about the center. First of all, the center is, is remarkable in that it has had continued Title VI support over, over many, many years. And, and that is a remarkable record. In fact, it may be unique in the United States. Maybe one of our panelists can tell us whether, that, whether or not that's the case. 
But I think that it, <clears throat> the, the continuous Title VI support is a reflection of the high regard in which the center is held, uh, certainly both within the federal government, but also nationally. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that was driven home during the last um, external review that we had when we, we had a, uh, a group of, of very distinguished Latin American scholars come who, uh, to review the center. And they made pretty clear to me that the Center for Latin American Studies is considered among the, certainly among the top three in the United States. Uh, maybe the panelists would argue it's uh, even higher, but, uh, but certainly among the top three and has consistently been so. And I think that that's a wonderful record, which is even <clears throat> more remarkable when you think about the fact that the Center for Latin American Studies is one of the truly interdisciplinary centers at the University of Florida. Interdisciplinary centers are not all that easy to, to run uh, from time to time. It brings together a diverse group of faculty who all have interest in some aspect, which the center claims to represent. But I think that the Center for Latin American Studies has been singularly successful over the years in bringing together faculty from all corners of the university. And I mean that, I mean that honestly, I mean, it brings together people from the humanities and the social sciences. It brings together specialists from, from IFAS, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, uh, people from the College of Business, uh, you know, a range of people with different interests, but who are all united by, by their common interest in Latin American studies. So I, I think this is remarkable. I think that it's due in large part to the leadership which the center has enjoyed. You see some of the, the past leaders and the current leaders sitting in front of you. And I certainly think that it, it's to their credit uh, in, in large part that the center has been so successful. And of course, uh, to the credit of the faculty who have participated over the years. Uh, I see nothing but a very bright future for, for the center. Uh, obviously, it, it's, uh, it, it's sort of trite to say this, but it is nevertheless true, if even often repeated, that, that Florida uh, sits in a, in a remarkable uh, geographic location and cultural location and political location with respect to Latin America. It's important that the University of Florida have a, have a vibrant center that will, that will work to um, really understand and to improve and promote uh, connections with Latin America uh, in all dimensions. And this is something that the center has been remarkably successful at doing. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have been able to support the center over the years that, that I've been around here. And uh, I fully expect that under the able leadership of uh, the of director uh, De La Torre, it will continue to achieve at the high level that has been its history. So thank you so much for inviting me to, to come and participate. Uh, I wish you and the center all the best. Thank you, Provost Glover. Well, now uh, Krista Markley, our communication specialist, is going to share a short video about the history of the center.
Thanks so much, Krista. So now we start with uh, Carmen Diana Deer, who will talk about the early history of the center. Okay. I just have a couple slides that I want to use as background. The center actually has two dates to, uh, to commemorate. Uh, June 30, or June 1930, which is what the, the first letterhead shows, uh, was when President John Kygert announced the creation of the Institute of Inter-American Affairs. And it was at this ceremony uh, where the very first Latin American was awarded an honorary degree, and that was Orestes Perada, the Cuban ambassador to the, uh, to the U.S. And it was in February 1931 that we had the formal inauguration of the center, which is why we're having this commemoration in, in February. And as that really nice video, I must say, uh, showed, uh, it was at, at this point that the Plaza of the Americas was named, 21 live oaks were, were planted, and the 21 flags of the 21 republics at that time of Latin America were uh, were, were shown. So the question that, that I've always had is how did President Tiger come to be so interested in, in Latin America uh, that he practically made it the centerpiece of his 19 years as president of Florida, 1928 uh, uh, to 1947. So I decided to explore the Tiger papers at the, the UF Library and Special Collections uh, to see you know, what I could come up with. Well, his background doesn't suggest any specific ties to, to Latin America. He was born in Tennessee, attended Vanderbilt University. He was a standout athlete in baseball, basketball, football, and, and track. But he was also a Phi Beta Kappa and was named uh, a Rhodes Scholar. Thus, he earned an MA degree in, in, at Oxford. So I think that that initial international experience was probably uh, really important in, in formulating um, his appreciation of the, the importance of, of international issues, at least. He began his teaching career at what is today Central Methodist University in Missouri and later on went on to the University of Kentucky, where he was a professor of philosophy and psychology. But he was also athletic director, basketball coach, and football coach at different points in, in time. Well, it was from Kentucky that he was appointed by President Warren Harding as the US Commissioner of um, Education in 1921. And as you see in this slide, he served both under um, Harding and then Calvin uh, Coolidge. During this time, he was considered a, a particularly energetic advocate of educational reform, as well as equal opportunity. Um, on those themes, he lectured widely across the, the US. But in his papers, I didn't find any evidence that he had ever been in Latin America. Uh, prior to, to coming to, uh, to UF. So back to that slide, so you can see my hypothesis, uh, one shared with, with Paul Wash, who's the person that has most dug into all of this um, archival research over, over the years. But we think that it was his friendship with Leo Rowe who is the Director General of the Pan American Union from 1920 to 1946, uh, that either sparked or certainly encouraged uh, his interest in, in Latin America. Over here on your left, you can see the list of the advisory council members that, that President Tigert uh, recruited in support of the, um, of the center. Well, when I learned about Leo Rowe, besides his being considered Mr. Pan-American 
uh, throughout Latin America, given his long tenure, uh, was that they both shared a real passion for education and educational exchanges. And this was particularly important at this period. Recall we're in the post-World War I uh, period uh, where the issues of you know, how to maintain international peace, you know, how to uh, reach international prosperity, you know, were uh, very much at the, the forefront. Tiger's correspondence also shows that he had met many distinguished Latin Americans while in, in Washington. Um, what I'm not sure of is whether this was directly through Roe um, or through his position you know, as Secretary Commissioner of, of Education. Uh, he would likely be an influential person in the administration that Latin American leaders would, would seek out. I did find an interesting press report from 1941 in the Birmingham uh, Age Herald. Uh, that claims that the reason that Tiger gave up his position as commissioner of education and came to UF as its third president was because of his vision that the university, due to its location in Florida, was, quote, destined to become key in the promotion of inter-American relations and hemispheric solidarity. And this article gives that as the reason that one of Tigert's first initiatives was to set up the Institute for Inter-American Affairs, uh, one of the first research and training institutes at UF outside of agriculture. And as we heard in the, the video, the very first such institute nationally. Well, these weren't particularly auspicious times for new initiatives at UF. Uh, the state had just experienced two devastating hurricanes. It was the beginning of the Great Dep Depression. And what I could glean from the correspondence was the funding difficulties that the university faced for, for most of Tigert's uh, tenure. But from the letterhead, you can also glean a bit about Tigert's strategy. You know, he immediately set up this national advisory board for the center. You know, so from the start, it had a national projection you know, that included senators, congressmen, uh, other folks in, in government, uh, folks from business, and as well as, as other uh, university uh, president. And Tiger's correspondence shows that he dedicated considerable energy to his pet project, to fundraising, uh, primarily to raise scholarship funds to bring Latin American students uh, to, to Florida. He also spent a lot of time lobbying the governor and state uh, legislators for, for funding in general. Um, but one of his specific activities on behalf of the center was to obtain tuition waivers for Latin American students, uh, which is something that we've held on to for all these many years as being particularly important to our uh, international diversity. Well, a final tidbit I wanted to share is how Tigert was definitely a hands-on president, which might explain why the center still reports to the provost's office. Uh, Tigert was not only fundraising, but personally dealing with appeals for scholarships that came from his many correspondents from, from Latin America. He was also actively engaged in setting up the very first student exchanges in Latin America uh, with the University of Havana, uh, where he also began to, to visit frequently. He was involved in curriculum and outreach efforts in the 1930s, the very first summer workshops were held uh, for teachers and other educators to come to the US campus for language training, as well as comprehensive studies in Latin American culture and in society. He promoted research uh, in his correspondence to see him writing letters to faculty telling them they had to get into the field and they had to get grants. Uh, something that we've learned to do very well over these 90 uh, years. 
And finally, he was an advocate for Roosevelt's good neighbor policies. And that's seen in some of his speeches as well as in the themes of some of the conferences that were put on by, by the Institute. Well, in closing, let me fast forward to 1958 and the passage of the National Defense Education Act. This is what created Title VI, uh, which today are the National Resource Centers in, in Area Studies. When the call went out for funding proposals, there was only a handful of Latin American Studies Centers um, in the US. And all of these were set up besides Florida um, in the 1940s, Texas, University of North Carolina, Stanford, UC Berkeley, University of New Mexico. All the rest, almost all the rest, uh, were set up as Latin American Studies Centers in response to Title VI. But because of the efforts of John Tiger, UF was among the first recipients of federal funding and does have the unique distinction of being funded in every cycle since then. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen Diana. Terry McCoy, please. Thank you. Um, I will see if I can build on Carmen's presentation and uh, lead us through my period as director. I became associated with the Center for Latin American Studies in 1975. And uh, my formal association ended in 2012 when I taught my last class. I served as director from 1985 to 1996. This, I might add, was a period of prosperity and expansion at the university. And we were part of that, uh, which meant we were well supported fiscally by the university, which of course is not always the case. I had the support of the provost in that time, mainly Bob Bryan, the vice provost, Jane Hemp, and uh, support staff that was very good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is sort of share my reflections on what occurred during this time that is uh, sort of relevant and part of the heritage it's with the center today. The first of all, Joe and, and Carmen mentioned we have a unique uh, some would say privileged status. Uh, we are uh, among uh, very few uh, university-wide centers. Uh, and certainly that's true uh, with our competitors as well, which is to say we're not located in a college uh, that, we re I, that the director reports to the provost and the director is a member of what was then the Council of Deans and Directors. We have faculty lines, which is also somewhat unusual for uh, centers. We had shared lines, half lines, and affiliates across campus. So <clears throat> the question is, what does the university get for this, <laughs> the special status? What's the value added? And in my mind, it is um, an inter a truly an interdisciplinary contribution to the University of Florida to the University of Florida and to the state of Florida, focusing on an important uh, geographic uh, region for the state of Florida. So we do uh, interdisciplinary training and research. We, we do, we did, we do outreach to public education and to the state. Uh, we do, uh, we compete for funding and international and national recognition. And the university benefits from uh, that. My, my, my sort of bottom line on all this was if the departments do it, then we don't, you don't need the center. But it's obvious that there have been lots of contributions in this way we bring together departments and colleges focusing on an area of importance to the university and to the state of Florida. As has also been uh, discussed, a key responsibility and expectation has been that we will uh, compete for and secure Title VI uh, resource and, and fellows uh, funding every four years. Uh, <clears throat> this brings funding, which is obviously important. It gives us flexibility to support things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. 
Uh, it leverages support from the university because I know uh, when I was director, I would have to go to the provost and say, now to get this, we need to have a faculty line in uh, department X, if we're gonna do Haitian Creole, for example. Uh, <clears throat> it also helped define uh, and help us uh, adapt the international standards dealing with uh, Latin America in our case. What, what should we be doing? In that regard, we had an advantage because we were in Florida. I happened to get my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, which as you know, is in Madison, Wisconsin, which is not very close to Latin America. And I also taught part-time at the end of my career at the University of Illinois, but Florida is part of Latin America. Um, we also, during this period of the, of the 80s, uh, entered into a consortium arrangement with Florida International University. Florida International University was both a partner and a competitor for funding. And uh, we shared a grant over several years. The director of the center at Florida during that time was Mark Rosenberg, who, as you know, has been president of the FIU now for several years. But in addition to these uh, material uh, benefits of Title VI, it gave us the recognition that Joe and Carmen talked about. We were competing with the Stanfords, the UCLA's, the Texas's of the United States. And I, I must say that's probably somewhat unique in the 80s. That was not the least bit unique for Florida today, which is a top 10 university. So that was important for a center director and for the center. And as has been pointed out, we were successful in doing that. During this period, we also launched uh, research and training programs. Uh, the, the most important cluster was the Tropical Conservation and Development Programs, which today have their own degrees and other affiliated. Uh, we also have done others. Uh, today, I, I went through the list and there are, in addition to the Latin American Business Environment Program, which I, uh, created after stepping down. There are a number of other research and training programs, which are obviously important, pulling together not only faculty across departmental and college lines, but also students, giving them opportunities they wouldn't have without this contribution. We strengthened the MALIS degree. The MALIS degree is a master's in Latin American studies, an inter interdisciplinary de degree awarded by uh, the center. We, uh, it has core uh, requirements, uh, seminars and other requirements for all of it. And then it's broken into specializations. And these specializations were developed uh, during the eighties and nineties. And they, they change over time. Uh, some are disciplinary, political science, sociology, et cetera. And others are topical linked to the research and training programs. This is a period of reasonably strong enrollment at the center. My, my recollection was some 40 students a year. Typically it takes a, a year and a half to two years, more likely two years. At that time, there was a, a, a thesis requirement. Uh, the major concentrations were probably history, political science, anthropology, and languages. That would not be true today at all. So it gives you a sense of the evolution of it. We developed or yeah, strengthened study abroad programs. We had a study abroad program in Colombia, but the Colombian situation became so dicey that we had to close it down. And uh, this would have been in the early eighties, I believe. We actually had a student who ended up in prison uh, who was um, <clears throat> asked to take a package abroad and that package abroad contained drugs. She was at the University of Tennessee and I got a call one day and it was her aunt. I didn't know anything about this. It was her aunt calling and telling me that her, her niece was in prison in Colombia. <laughs> and <clears throat> the odd thing is I met this uh, girl, woman, several years later and she seemed no worse for wear. <laughs> I can't imagine serving time in Colombia and, <clears throat> and, and not being affected by it. We also opened the Brazil um, language and culture program in Rio, which is which was is still strong today. It was launched in uh, 1977. 
and uh, it became a national resource really for training in, in uh, Portuguese language. And then we spun off other programs associated with those. It was during this time that we, we each Title VI center had to have a special language. Spanish and Portuguese were not enough. And we had initially a language of the uh, Andean region, Aymara. Uh, but during this time, we transitioned to Haitian Creole, which is uh, uh, my understanding is a, a very good, strong language today. And that was uh, my experience as well. We start signed agreements or convenios with foreign universities institutions, which brought foreign professors and specialists on campus for periods of time and provided off, uh, off campus opportunities for our students and faculty. This was the beginning also of private funding, which today is so important to the university and to the center. We had been very successful, as Maxine pointed out, in getting uh, public grants. The public Title VI is the biggest example, but we had grants for research. There was a major research project undertaken by William Carter stu studying chronic marijuana use in Costa Rica, actually, of all things, and other things like that but very little in the way of private funding. I, I went through the list today, which I think has 19 different funds in it. And the, there were two or three at that time that I took over as director. So it, the university moved on that during the time that I was director. Our first fundraising um, effort was kind of interesting. Uh, the university had no foundation then. It had one uh, official, one fundraiser, believe it or not. It's the University of Florida in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and he got um, inside information that there was a Mex uh, there was a uh, uh, investor in Miami who invested heavily in Mexican paper companies. And he was uh, somebody we should investigate giving funds to the Center for Latin America. So we he was invited up, we had a meeting, uh, we had all kinds of social events associated with it. We got to the meeting with the, with the funding officer, the director and associate director and some of the faculty. And um, <clears throat> the president of the university could not actually ask the guy for the money. <laughs> and finally the, the, uh, the uh, funding officer said, what we're talking about Mr. So-and-so is a million dollars. <laughs> and the guy said, I don't have a million dollars. <laughs> so it made the rest of his visit kind of awkward. He did actually end up giving money to uh, the University of Miami, which was, I think, considerably more than a million dollars. The breakthrough came in the funding of the Bacardi Eminent Scholar Chair. We were given a challenge grant by the Mellon Foundation. We needed to raise that, an, uh, 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 several hundred thousand dollars from a separate uh, donor to trigger the Emmett Scholar funding for a chair. And with through the Bacardi Foundation, through the Bacardi Company, which you may know of, we were able to do that. And um, this overcame, this is interesting for me because one of the things is this special. Uh, a special uh, status we have at the University of Florida likes to is goes on challenge from time to time. And President John Lombardi, who came to the presidency in early 90s, was one of those people who was skeptical. Why does this center need this particular status? But in selling uh, the university to the Bacardi Foundation, he assured them that the center was a special place and it always be protected by him as president. So uh, that made me feel much safer in our special relationship. Through funding, we also became very active in working with our alums, much more so than we had been. And I think that was one of the real important benefits from this and continues to be that. The scholar chair itself, as you know, brings an eminent scholar or eminent States person from Latin America or from the United States or elsewhere to serve, to be here with us for the year. And the first one was the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Oscar Adias of Costa Rica. 
So we've had some really good people here with that funding. Today, as you all know, private funding is very important particularly for our students, because if you go through the list of funds, they all, almost all are about private funding for students, student support programs. As I said, I counted 19 of them on the web page. Today is, I understand, or this week, Gator Giving Day, which I think is self-explanatory. And if you need, if you're undecided about which of these 19 you'd like to donate to, I would recommend the McCoy Travel Scholarship. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Phil Williams, please. Thank you, Carlos, and thanks for getting the gang all back together again. <clears throat> it's great to be here to celebrate uh, 90 years of Latin American studies at UF. So I'm gonna discuss some of the, the challenges to area studies more broadly that arose during the late 90s and 2000s and how these were reflected in the center's own evolution from the 2000s onward. One of the first major challenges was the globalization critique of area studies. And according to globalization scholars like Arjun Apatarai, area studies had grown too comfortable with its maps of the world in which groups and their ways of lives are marked by differences of culture. These maps were no longer possible to justify in the context of globalization, which was marked by increasingly fluid and porous borders, unprecedented mobility of people, capital information and ideas, the decline of the nation state and the rise of transnational social movements. There was a need to debate the very definition of colonial derived areas. This was not to suggest that borders were meaningless. For those of us who can fly con papeles, borders present a mo the momentary nuisance of getting our passport stamps. But for those who risk their life and limb to cross our Southern border, the authority of the nation state had lost none of its salience in the 21st century. The globalization critique found a receptive ear within certain foundations uh, who began to redirect some of their uh, funding priorities beginning in the late 1990s. The SSRC ACLS joint uh, 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 area com committees uh, were eliminated during that time. The Ford Foundation began to reorganize itself de-emphasizing area and launched a $25,000 $25 million initiative in 1998 called Crossing Borders to rethink and revitalize area studies. The Rockefeller Foundation also reorganized itself with a focus on issues related to globalization. This globalization critique really presented a false dichotomy of area studies versus globalization studies. Many globalization theorists recognize that globalization rather than leading to homogenization is a deeply historical uneven and localizing process. And at the same time, many area study specialists recognizing that, recognize that localities are subject to the dynamics of the global and that there was no longer this natural relation between culture or culture to geography and social territory. These themes were evident in a number of the center's initiatives during the 2000s. One example was the Rockefeller Residential Fellowships Program that focused on the topic of religion, globalization and social change in the Americas. This also became reflected in, this, in the center's increasingly hemispheric vi vision of Latin American Caribbean issues to include the growing presence of people of Latin American Caribbean descent in the United States. As Arturo Escobar wrote in 2006, Latin America today is a global reality. Latin America is literally the world over. Uh, other examples were a series of Ford funded projects focusing on Latin, Latin American transnational migration that I was involved in and the Latin, Latin, Latinx studies initiative uh, that was uh, became a, a priority during Car Carmen Diana's term and uh, gained added impulse during my term uh, with the hiring of Nick Vargas. Another significant challenge was the rise of global and international studies as an area of teaching and in institutional reorganization. Some universities created new global studies institutes and programs that displaced traditional area study centers. And at some of those universities, this shift also had significant budgetary consequences for area studies programs and library collections. This never happened at the University of Florida. Uh, an international studies major was developed but never in a way that challenged area study centers at UF. And if I recall, 
Um, the international studies major at UF under the International Center actually has regional tracks uh, for, for students to pursue. And in fact, the UF administration continued to invest in Latin American studies and other area studies centers, even during the Great Recession, uh, when, I when I actually began my tenure as director in 2009. My first year as director, in the midst of a recession, we carried out the successful search for a new TCD director, which brought Betty Loisel to the center. And despite cuts across the university, the center fared much better than other units on campus. In addition, the, the university carried through on its commitments for matching support to help launch the MVP program in my first year. And this included two, two faculty hires, one in global health and Glenn, and Glenn Galloway's hiring as director, plus a staff position, a full-time staff position, as well as significant support in the early years of the MVP for student assistantships and field practicum. Another example um, early in my tenure was during the, the Obama administration, as a result uh, of the recession, there was significant budget cut cuts across federal agencies. Title VI funding was cut 40%, uh, I think over a two year period. Um, and the provost, and again, I wanna acknowledge um, Provost Glover, he stepped up um, to provide bridge funds for all of our area study centers to help cushion the blow over a period of two to three years. Some years later in 2000, 13, uh, 14, when UF launched its preeminence initiative to lure senior scholars to, to, to UF as part of a series of cluster hires, the center's La uh, Latin American development uh, hire proposal was one of the select few that was chosen during the first round and resulted in the hiring of Catherine Tucker and Bob Walker. These actions represented significant investments in Latin American studies by UF's leadership. And, I, and again, I want to acknowledge uh, Pro has Glover's support throughout my tenure as director. And I think it really reflected on the part of the UF leadership, uh, uh, th this recognition that the center was really one of the crown jewels of the university and continues to be to this day. One last significant challenge uh, to area studies and international education more broadly came during the Trump administration. The Trump administration was the first administration to actually propose zeroing out funding for Title VI since its inception. As, you, as many of you may know, uh, Title VI historically has, has enjoyed bipartisan support in the Congress. Uh, and this, again, was the first administration to ever propose eliminating completely Title VI funding. The Consortium for uh, National Resource uh, Center Directors convened directors at, to Washington in 2017 for a day of advocacy. I and other area studies directors from UF and across the country met with our Senate and congressional delegations on the Hill to educate and advocate on behalf of Title VI. Mary Reisner, our Associate Director for Outreach would represent the center uh, the following year. These efforts were ultimately successful in preserving Title VI funding throughout the Trump administration, reflecting the broad bipartisan support for training area and language specialists as important to US national security interests and global security. In a 2014 article on the future of Latin American studies and the multiple challenges that it fa faced, uh, Charles Hale, the former pr uh, president of LASA, pointed to four key principles underlying the success and resiliency of Latin American studies. And, I, and I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about each, each of these four because I think they very much apply to, to Latin American studies at UF. The first is our insistence on deep cultural uh, cult uh, contextual understanding, including language, culture, and history in whatever we choose to study. And we see this principle infused across the center's academic research and training programs, outreach programs. We drill this into our students. It's part of the center's DNA as long as I can remember. And I cannot imagine a Latin Americanist who doesn't have relevant language proficiency or an experience-based sense of the people, places, or natural worlds that they study. The second is the indispensability of interdisciplinary study. And we've heard uh, about this from both uh, Carmen Diana and Terry. The center has long been this campus hub for interdisciplinary programs and initiatives. One of the few spaces on campus where faculty, faculty could truly engage in interdisciplinary work, where they could leave their disciplinary baggage at the door 
and, and really engaged in, in interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary research. And for the center, I think that uh, the TCD program that was mentioned really set the standard for other programs to follow, bridging the social and natural sciences, bringing together scholars and practitioners. Other examples included the Gender and Development Working Group, the launch of the MDP program in, in 2010. And during my tenure, the decision to actually eliminate disciplinary specializations within the MALIS program and to shift exclusively to interdisciplinary and regional uh, specializations, including a large number of new, of new uh, specializations. Uh, and the strengthening of these, these uh, specializations into really communities of, of research and teaching. And then a the third principle is collaboration. The center has taken seriously critiques of Latin American studies, Northern gaze, the subject object dichotomy, embracing collaborative research methods in dialogue with colleagues and communities in the region, as well as incorporating the, uh, the participation of community organizations and NG NGOs as alternative knowledge producers. The principle of collaboration is evident throughout the programs at the center. And, and, and fourth and final is the principle of teaching and scholarship that advances knowledge while also trying to make a positive impact on the world. There are many examples of this across the center's programs. The MDP program is just the latest examples of how our students try to advance the frontiers of knowledge while also trying to have an imp a positive impact through their work. This principle was also evident in, in a, the center's decision during my time to create a faculty position, I think the first ever in the United States that focused on human rights, peace and justice in Latin American studies that brought Joel Correa to the center and an important new direction for the center. These four principles I think uh, have much to do with explaining the success and resiliency of Latin American studies at UF over so many years. And I feel privileged to have played a small part in that history. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you to all of you for these very interesting reflections on the history of Latin American studies here at the center in the United States and where are we going to go from here now. Uh, one thing I would like to mention is that in addition to the factors that Phil was saying, I think one of the challenges is also start to think globally from Latin America which is something that in Latin America scholars have always been doing, differently from other social sciences that are more regionally based. In Latin America, people study in Europe, the United States, or within Latin America, so we're very cosmopolitan. But I think that the challenge, and what for me is very interesting, is to think about several processes from the experience of Latin America and to see how the, how we, what we can offer to the world in terms of that. For instance, in development, it's a critical area where Latin America has been at the center of critical thinking of development. But also in terms of other issues like democratization, authoritarianism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that I think that will be something interesting for the future. So before I have some questions, I would like to open this space for you guys to ask questions or to interact in any issue that you find interesting. So the floor is open to anybody to start. Well, let me begin. Uh, yeah, brought up all sorts of memories as well as, as issues listening to, uh, to Terry and, and Phil. Uh, I was of course struck by the, the student that was thrown in jail in Colombia, uh, Terry, but you know, also the, the fact that uh, when you arrived that you know, UF did not yet have a UF foundation of, of fundraisers and that all of this is really so, so new to us. Uh, I think that one of the things that surprised me when I arrived as director, this was 2004, was that you know I knew that fundraising was you know, certainly part of the job description, uh, but I didn't realize what a whole professional world development consisted of. And I was immediately thrown into really intense training uh, by the UF Foundation uh, which I must say was, was excellent. I mean, this was definitely, you know, a professionalized field 
uh, now. And all of us that were, we had directors of university level centers or deans were of course um, expected to, to quickly become experts, you know, at it. Um, and, you know, and that made me realize that, yeah, we'd done some efforts beforehand, you know, certainly very successfully with uh, foundations more, more than anything, but that the private efforts, you know, outside of Bacardi, which was really the, you know, the five-star example at, at that point in time, um, you yeah, know, we're really still in their infancy. So, you know, for me, one of the real challenges was to, uh, to begin focusing in a more, let's say, concerted way on our alumni and how to integrate all of that expertise uh, because it really is you know, the resource that we have in the alumni that have gone through the MALAS uh, program in, in particular, uh, but also from undergraduates, Carlos being the, the perfect example um, of it, um, you know, was, was definitely a, a challenge. You know, so when I think back among, you know, what are the things that, that I accomplished was organizing that first alumni advisory board and to begin to, to do that kind of serious thinking of um, how do we put out the, the roots? And how do we do that in a situation where we're really at a disadvantage compared with the, the colleges that have you know, that huge undergraduate alumni base uh, to draw upon? You know, the fact that our direct alumni are really the MALIS program, um, but then increasingly over the years, of course, the, the folks in the different uh, specialization certificates, et cetera, that uh, yeah, do take us on the one hand down to uh, the undergraduates across campus, um, you know, but also like through TCD, for example, that you know has its own um, semi-autonomous fundraising effort. Um, it, this leads me to to another question that that I see really changing a lot historically, and you know, it goes back to Phil's comments on. Uh, globalization versus area studies and the, the value of an interdisciplinary um, master's you know, or interdisciplinary undergraduate degree or, or even PhD. And we've seen different answers to, to this at different points of time. I think generally we're reflecting national trends. Um, I've always wanted to examine in more detail the center's experience with its own interdisciplinary uh, PhD program. And it showed up in the video uh, with the name change from the Institute to the, the School of International, or of, um, what was it, Inter-American Studies, uh, where we did offer a PhD. Uh, that was sort of the, the trend um, for, for a while in the, the 1950s. Um, and then, you know, after the, the 60s, area studies were strong, but seemed like master's degrees were really the way to go. But when I reflect on the size of our MALAS program uh, back, Terry, in, in your period, you know, when there were 20 to 30 MALAS students each year, and um, the difficulty in the 2000s, you know, to have classes, let's say, well, most of them have averaged probably 12 to, to 15. Um, you know, really reflect uh, a change in that. Um, you know, with that, the competition in terms of other undergraduate students and, you know, why we've never done, um, you know, a BA in Latin American studies per se under our own um, direction. Um, I don't have the answers for that. I certainly don't wish we had done it uh, any other way. Uh, but I think that it's something we always have to keep in mind in terms of how we project ourselves to, uh, towards the, um, you know, the, the future. And if we'll continue to, to focus on the, uh, the master's degree as our own center degree. I would just add you know, your point about alumni. I think the other way that we've been able to integrate alumni and certainly we did during our tenure was 
really to provide a network of support, particularly in terms of career options um, for our students. Um, and we've got alumni, you know, in, in the public sector, the private sector, the NGO sector. Um, they're also a community, uh, a network of support for many of our research projects, many of their research and, and practitioners in the region. And so I know one thing we did was to have a number of, of career workshops and opportunities for alumni just to, to, to zoom in, um, to meet with our Malice students, to talk about what was important to get at, that they got out of their Malice degree. Um, so I think that that's one other area of support. The other thing I'd say, you know, and you mentioned the private um, funding part or other sorts of fund, Title VI is gonna go away at some point, right? Um, or, or possibly, you know, UF could lose it, God forbid. But, you know, when, when I, when, during my directorship, the three Title VI um, cycles that I was involved in, I mean, the big giants got knocked out. You know, Texas lost funding this last round, uh, Tulane lost funding, UCLA lost funding, um, you know, all the historic centers at one point or another lost funding. Um, so the fact that we were able to survive through that, but again, you, you know, administrations come and go and there's been bipartisan support, but you would think at one time the funding may disappear. And so what I, I think for any director, Carlos, you always have to be thinking beyond Title VI. What's fortunate about our center is many centers, they actually depend on Title VI uh, support to fund their outreach uh, director or an associate director, a lot of staff funding. And the fact that we don't use Title VI for uh, to support faculty or, or, or staff lines. It's really for the program, um, the value added that, that it provides. Um, but yeah, that, that's gonna be a challenge for, for any director in the future. Harry? Yeah, just a couple of observations relevant to what <clears throat> Phil and Carmen said. Um, what, one, John Lombardi was very crucial uh, for the university, but also for Latin American studies. He, he, he is, he was, and he is a distinguished Latin American historian. And uh, what I found was he, he had really um, doubts about the status of the center, but he came around to it and he became a big defender of it. And, and that was important in this transition, I think, from the um, early history of the center to what it is today. Secondly, I, I, I'm a somewhat, I don't want to put this too strongly, but I'm kind of um, concerned apropos of student um, meeting with, fact, uh, with alumni uh, job uh, kinds of panels is that the business community, the business school at the university does not seem to be an important part of of the center's uh, reach these days. And I think that um, if you're talking about student getting, students getting jobs, that's probably not a smart idea. What you guys are talking about is very important. Uh, we are working very hard on development. We created a, a commitment of development with faculty because as you guys were pointing out, differently from colleges that have large numbers of alumni, we have a very restricted number of alumni. So our development goals have to be with the private sector and our foundations for research projects. So that's something that we are doing. Another thing that we are doing a lot these days is trying to integrate more undergraduate education. Perhaps that has to do with my experience. For me, the center was my home and in part who I am. And I don't know if I am a role model or not, I don't think so. But in any case, whoever I am, I owe it to the center to a big extent. So to have more undergraduate engagement with undergraduates, to bring more undergraduates to our classes, to, to, to work more on the certificate with undergraduates. And, and to continue to work with alumni, and especially we have been working a lot changing the Latin American and business environment program. I think that the challenge is there is to make a business and a business environment program that sort of reflects also what the center does in terms of uh, conservation and ecological issues, right? It will be very interesting to think about how to integrate our emphasis on the, on, 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 on the environment 
with an emphasis in, in the business sector. And another thing that we're working hard, and I think it's a challenge in all US universities, and you guys have done a lot before I came, is in terms of diversity. I mean, the center has always been a diverse place in the sense that many Latin American middle class people have been here, but we have been trying to increase more the number of Afro Latin Americans and indigenous people coming here and hopefully also to become faculty here at some point. So, but you know, I am optimistic about the future. I don't know if the future with Title VI, I am also, I agree with Phil, probably Title VI will disappear. I hope I am not the one who ends up not getting it. And we will try our best, but we have to think about life perhaps without Title VI. And there are other ways and other forms of trying to get that, uh, those funds. And, um, Another thing that we have not talked too much about is the importance of our annual conferences. And Marta Cohen was saying that for her, that has been one of the best ways in which we have created an intellectual community. Uh, if, if Carlos, if I could make a comment. Please. I, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about Title VI. Title VI is important because it does bring you a margin of extra resources um, that allows the center to do some, some wonderful things. But, but the other thing about Title VI is it has been a, the, the de facto method of recognizing excellence, in particular in Latin American studies in the United States, right? And so if, if Title VI goes away because, uh, you know, for whatever reason, the federal government decides they're not gonna fund that anymore, um, number one, we hope it's not because of a drop in, in perceived quality or excellence of what we're doing here at the University of Florida. But number two, I think then it becomes important for the center to say, um, how is it that we get the message out that we continue to be recognized for the good work that we're doing, that, that we maintain the perception that we are one of the very high achieving centers in the United States. Because I think that that's certainly what the university values. We, we value you know, your good work and the reflected glow of your excellence on the university. And Title VI has been sort of the shorthand method to say, yeah, we've got a really good center. So, um, you know, we hope Title VI won't go away, but if someday it does go away, it's not a disaster so long as the center continues to do its good work and to be recognized for its good work. But to your point, Joe, I think in some ways, the, the center is it's sort of the best kept secret at, at the University of Florida, especially when you're talking to alumni. And I think alumni don't, recognize that we have this top ranked cent center at the University of Florida. And so I think that's, you know, it's not just the center, it's, it's the university leadership as well, um, you know, promoting um, th this center amongst our alumni. So there's a broader recognition amongst our alumni and pride um, in the stature and, and the history and stature of the center. And, and I know President Fox, when I was there, he, he, would, he would talk about the center in some, in some of his public addresses, but uh, but what was amazing to me, meeting with alums in Miami, how, how few of them knew about the center or certainly didn't know it was this top ranked center. Yeah. If I could add to that, I think that's where the business connection is important because many of these alums in South Florida are in business basically. And I think you, that, that, that connection comes through the College of Business. And uh, to the extent that that can be uh, preserved and reinforced, I think it's a good thing. Part of it is giving them what we now consider important, but the other part of it is listening to them and to their students in terms of job opportunities. Where are the jobs? and What, what kind of relevant Latin American training is important for them to get these jobs? Uh, I, I think you do have an opportunity right now where, the, where an interesting moment in history, you know, we just have changed deans of the college of business. And so it really is an opportunity to have a new conversation with a new cast of characters and see what, you know, the new points of contact and interaction could be. Yeah. Yes, I, I met with the new dean of the business school and that's a very interesting thing that we're planning to do there. 
because Mary Reisner, with all of the energy that she has, she's the one who's directing now the Latin American business environment program. So that's one of the main areas of, of development that we're thinking about. And in terms of recognition, that's a very good point. And we have not, we do not promote the center very well. I mean, we, we have to make more efforts to show what makes us a, a, as a unique place. For instance, the Latin American Research Review for the first time is going to come to the Center of Latin American Studies and to the University of Florida. And it's the main journal for Latin American Studies. And Professor Martina is going to be the first, it is already the first female editor of that journal. So there are all of these other indicators of excellence that we have to work hard, not only obtaining them, but also in broadcasting and advertising well who we are. And so we are not just a, a well-kept secret at the university, but we are put there, uh, you know, at the front. Uh, and, and I would encourage the center to, in, to engage with the machinery of the university. Of course, the university tries to broadcast its reputation. And so we do have an office of news and public yeah. affairs, which, which is quite effective and, and broadcasts a lot of information. And through the office of research, um, you know, the, they, they try to promote the research achievements of the university as well. So I think forming a relationship with those two offices will help you to get the message out more broadly. Well, we're almost out of time because Carmen Diana has an appointment and, and we are all very busy. And thanks so much, Leo, for joining us. Let me end up by inviting you. Uh, I mean, it's giving week, giving day on February 18. So I encourage all of our alumni to, you know, to, to remember that this is the date. And also to remind you of our next panel that is going to be on Friday at one o'clock, where we're going to have people talking about the, I mean, one of the strengths, intellectual strengths of the center has been its scholarship on critical development. So we're going to have people talking about the different traditions of critical development studies at the center. And I really want to thank all of you. You are very busy people for your time, for your engagement, for your support, and for your continued dedication in to making the center what it is. I am very honored to be in a place like this. And my effort will be to not only to keep it as good as it is, but to try to make it better in some areas where we have not really develop it so much. So thanks so much and thank to all of you and congratulations to the center and the faculty and the students and the alumni and the support from all of your offices and, and you as individuals. And the current center director, of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Good to see you all. Thank you. <laughs>